Hi everyone. Today we're going to be learning about modern communication. So in this section we're going to be looking at digital data, GPS, and other ways that we use waves in communication in the current day. To begin with, we'll be talking about the differences between analog and digital technology. The difference between analog and digital is pretty clear cut, and today we use mostly digital signals for communication. And we'll see why in just a moment. Now there are two kinds of signal using communication and you don't get any prizes for guessing what they're called. First of all we have analog signals. Now analog signals as we can see vary smoothly and continuously with time. So these are the sort of things that might look like a mathematical function. We don't ever get you know jagged edges or points or whatever like that like that sort of thing. It's always nice and smooth and curved if you zoom in close enough. On the other hand, digital signals look a little bit different. These will jump up and down because they can only take on a certain number of values. They can't take on an infinite number of y values or an infinite number of x values. So it means that we get this little sort of stepping or jumping shapes. Uh, in computer terminology, it's what we call aliasing. Now in analog recording, uh, and in analog playback systems, of course, we have a continuously varying signal. Remember, this is the very sort of smooth shape and continuous shape that we get. The recorded waveform, whether it's on an LP disc or a tape cassette or something like that, will exactly match the waveform that it was recording. Right? So if it wants to record a sine wave, then the recording will look like a sine wave. There won't be any jagged edges or aliasing. So the grooves in an LP record, for example, which we can see over here, a bit of old technology, but bear with me, the grooves will move back and forth in exactly the same way that the air pressure in the sound wave moves back and forth. Right? So if you could zoom in and get a microscopic picture of one of the grooves in this LP track, it would be varying up and down exactly in the same way as the sound wave that produced it, and indeed the sound wave that it produces when you play it. In a cassette tape, another piece of uh, fairly outdated technology, we have vibrations of a sound wave encoded on a magnetic piece of tape, which of course is wrapped up inside the cassette. So, in order to make this conversion, we first represent the sound wave as a voltage, right? And we do this with a microphone. So, we have a voltage. We can use electromagnetism to turn that voltage into a magnetic field, right? And this magnetic field is what is encoded on the tape inside the cassette. And because it's analog data, it means the strength of the magnetic field won't suddenly jump up and down. It'll vary continuously. There won't be any aliasing. It'll just be a continuous smooth shape in the same way as the sound wave is a continuous smooth shape. Now, the way that we convert one form of energy to another is with a transducer. A transducer is just any sort of device that will turn one wave into another sort of wave, right? Like a microphone or a loudspeaker. The thing is, they're not perfect. There is no way that we can get a completely accurate copy of any sound. And so in order to measure how close the copy is to the original, we use a term called fidelity. And so the fidelity of a waveform, if it's very high fidelity, means that the waveform that you produce is very, very similar to the original waveform. If you have very low fidelity, then it means that the sound that you reproduce is similar in some aspects, but not a completely accurate representation of the original sound. So high fidelity sound systems are sometimes called hi-fi sound systems. So fidelity is lowered 
whenever we transmit the signal uh, or whenever we try to transform it into a different form. That means that if we have to send a signal through a longer distance or through more different changes and conversions between energy types, we end up with a lower fidelity signal. Right? This is particularly important for an analog signal, that is one that varies smoothly and continuously, because if, even if you make one tiny mistake, that'll be encoded in the analog wave. There's no room for error. This is a little different to what happens with a digital, digital signal, but we'll get onto that in a moment. If we look at a digital signal, as we can see, it can only take on certain values, both in the x-axis and in the y-axis. So it is possible to convert an analog signal into a digital signal, like we can see here, by representing the analog signal as a list of numbers. Right? And this is useful for computers, for example. Computers work only with numbers, so they only work in digital information. Computers cannot process analog signals. So if we want to feed something into a computer, or reproduce a sound from a computer, we need to change it from an analog signal uh, into a digital signal. So to digitize a sound wave, we first take the sound wave, or the analog wave, and we divide it into a number of different segments called samples. Right? So in this case, each sample would be the width of one of these little slices. So you can see that as we go across, we've taken one, two, three, four, five, six, seven samples on each side. Right? And we've taken them all at the same interval. All the samples are the same length. So once we've taken each sample, we look at the amplitude of the analog wave at each uh, part of the sample. And that's what we turn into our digital wave. So a higher sampling rate will produce higher fidelity. If we have a very, very high sampling rate, then that means that all the slices are very, very thin and very, very close together. And instead of getting this sort of aliased, jagged look, we'll end up with all the slices so close together that it will be almost impossible to tell the digital wave from the analog one. So some media that use digital waves in order to store information are more modern uh, methods of storage. Things like CDs, computers, digital radio. Uh, of course, if we're talking about storage, we can also think about things like USB sticks, that is, flash memory drives. So the sampling rate of a CD and music recorder on a CD is 44.1 kilohertz. Remember that a hertz is a per second. So 44.1 thousand hertz is 44.1 thousand samples per second. Right? So you can see it's going to be a lot of samples. And in fact, because these samples are so thin and so close together, it's almost impossible to tell that you're listening to a digitized version of an analog recording. It sounds analog to our ears. DVDs have a much higher sampling rate. They can get as high as 192 kilohertz. That is, in every second of sound that you listen to on a DVD, there are 192,000 samples. So in this case, it's just about impossible to tell the difference between uh, the digitized version and the original analog version. This means that DVDs have much higher fidelity than CDs. So higher sampling rates will produce a higher fidelity and they'll also produce a larger amount of data. Remember that every sample takes up a certain amount of data on the disk or on the flash memory drive or on the hard drive, right? If we take more samples, that's going to take up more memory.
when we're transmitting sound between computers, for example, so if you're talking on a headset over Skype, then we want to transfer information very, very quickly. If we take a very, very high sampling rate, then there's too much information and we can't uh, transfer it over computers very quickly. So computer headsets use a much lower fidelity for their uh, transmission of voice, for example. A lot of headsets sample at about 8 kilohertz, which is much, much lower than that of even a CD. And that's why it's possible to tell uh, when you're listening to someone over a computer uh, that they're not using a very high quality microphone, for example. We can still hear their voice and make out the words, but you wouldn't want to try and listen to high quality audio with this sort of transmission. On the plus side, because it's quite low fidelity and quite a low sampling rate, there's only a small amount of data that we actually have to transmit, which means that the data can be sent in real time and it's possible to have a conversation with someone over the net. So computers use binary digits, that is ones and zeros, to read data, right? But in the digital recordings that I showed you before, there were a whole number of different levels that the data could be at. It wasn't just ones and zeros, right? There weren't just two values, there were about you know, 16 of them or something like that. So if we want to convert a digital signal into binary, that is just ones and zeros, then we simply take the number that the sample represents and we represent it in base 2. Now I'm sure you've covered bases in mathematics already, but just a quick refresher. Normally we count in base 10. That means that we count the numbers up until we reach 10, and until we reach 10 all the numbers have a single digit, right? Once we reach 10, we have two digit numbers. We have a digit in the tens column and a digit in the ones column. In base two, we start counting until we get up to two, and then two is the first two digit number. So then we'll have a one in the twos column and a zero in the ones column. Instead of going ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, we go ones, twos, fours, eights going up by factors of 2 instead of factors of 10. So numbers in base 2 have more digits than they have in base 10. If you're trying to represent 8, for example, then in base 2, that's 4 digits long. In base 10, it's still only 1. So instead of tens, hundreds, thousands, we have 1s, 2s, 4s, 8s. We can see a table showing some conversions between uh, base 10 numbers, which we're used to, and base 2 numbers, or binary numbers. So you can see right away that 0 and 1 are going to be the same. But remember, we don't have a separate digit for 2. Instead, we put a 1 in the 2's column. We can see that uh, we're going to move up through the columns very, very quickly. In fact, by the time we get to 15, we're at 1, 1, 1, 1, which means that if we add one more, uh, then 1 plus 1 is going to be 1, 0. So put the 0 down, carry the 1. Then we have another 1 plus 1. That equals 1, 0. So put the 0 down, carry the 1, and it will continue on until we get the number for 16, being 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Right? So this means that the length of a binary number, in terms of the number of digits, is much longer than a base 10 number. On the other hand, we're only ever using ones and zeros. The great advantage of this is that if we put these numbers onto a computer, the computer can represent a one with an electric current and a zero by a lack of electric current. So we don't need to worry about the strength of the electric current at all, simply whether it's there or not. So by storing each, uh, each sample, so each number representing the height of the wavelength, with a 16-digit binary number, 
in terms of data, that's two bytes, then we can store 65,536 uh, different values, which is going to be more than enough for any of the uh, heights that we can think of for an analog signal. So we use an uh, analog to digital converter, which might look something like this, in order to convert the analog signal to the digital signal. And so what it will do is it will take the uh, analog signal, cut it into slices or samples, sample the amplitude at each part and assign it a number from 0 to 65,000 or so. Once it's done this and it's got a whole list of numbers, it can turn those into binary. So on a CD, if we have a 1 on the CD, then that's represented by a tiny, tiny little pit on the surface of a CD. And a 0 is represented by the lack of a pit. We'll be talking a bit more about this method of storage in a moment. For now, though, uh, we're at the end of the theory. So hopefully now we know a little bit about the difference between analog signals and digital signals, and how digital signals can be turned into binary numbers. So let's go on to some questions. Question 1. For each of the following media, determine whether they store waveforms in an analog or in a digital form. We'll start off with a cassette tape. Not a very common form of storage these days. In fact, it's quite outdated. So we know that it must be an analog form of storage. How about B, a floppy disk? Now, once again, this is quite an old form of storage. And just like the cassette tape, it uses magnetic fields in order to store data. But hang on. Floppy disks are used in computers. And computers can't process analog information. So the floppy disk must be a digital storage medium. How about a USB flash drive? Well, this one's much more modern. In this case, even though we can store uh, things that look like analog sound system, uh, signals, the analog sound signals are in fact digitized. USB flash drives are used in computers, and computers can only process digital data. So, they must be a digital storage medium. Finally, what about a vinyl record, like the LP record I showed you earlier? This is, of course, one of the older forms of storage. It's hardly used anymore, and it stores musical information, right? It's not used in a computer. It's the data on it is translated directly uh, to a loudspeaker, which uh, reproduces the wave on the, uh, on the record itself. And so the wave must be in an analog form. We don't need to worry about interpreting ones and zeros and then uh, processing them into a sound wave. Instead, we just read straight from the record. Question two. Given the original waveform up here on the left, which digital recording has the highest fidelity out of these three choices below. Can you remember what fidelity is? It's simply a measurement of how accurate the waveform is to the original version. So we talk about the fidelity of a copy or of a record of some original sound wave. So here's the original sound wave that we have, just a simple sine wave. And we're trying to figure out which one of these is the best copy of it? So we can see that the one on the right is very jagged. We don't sample it extremely often, and we can only take about three or four, uh, four different values that aren't zero. We've got one, two above zero, and one, two below zero. So this means that we're only, we're not using a 16 digit binary number to encode it. We might be only be using uh, a four-digit binary number. Here we have a many, a many more different uh, numbers that we can take on. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, around ten. So this is higher fidelity uh, than our rightmost option, 
If we look at the leftmost one though, the sampling rate is closer together and we can have even more different values for the height of the wave. And even if we're not looking at the sampling rate or the encoding, we can still see that uh, our original shape looks most similar to this leftmost shape. So, this is the correct answer. The leftmost shape has higher fidelity than either of the other two shapes because it's most similar to the original version. Question 3. What base 10 numbers are represented by the following binary numbers? We'll start off with 1, 0, 0, 0. Now, when we're using base 10 numbers, we talk about the columns for each digit, right? We have the 1's column, the 10's column, the 100's column, and the 1000's column, right? Now, in base 2, the numbers look just the same, except this is, this is not 10, this is 1, 0, base 2, which is going to be a 2. So our columns end up being 1's, increased by a factor of 2, 2's, increased by a factor of 2, 4's, increased by a factor of 2, and 8's, right? So let's look at our example here. 1, 0, 0, 0. In this case, we have no units, no 2s, no 4s, and 1, 8. So what's this number going to be? Well, it is, it is of course, just 8. That makes sense, right? All right, let's go on to a different number. 0, 1, 1, 0. So once again, we have the 8's column, the 4's column, the 2's column, and the 1's column. So how many 8's do we have? Well, 0. How many 4's do we have? 1. How many 2's do we have? Also 1. How many 1's do we have? None. So add them up, and we'll get 6. Finally, what is 1, 0, 1, 1? So, in this case, we do have an 8 in the first column. We have no 4s. We have a 2. And we have a 1. So, add them all together. And we get 11. Remember that just like we can represent any number we want with base 10, it's possible to represent any number we want with base 2 or indeed any base greater than 2. Question 4. Give an advantage and a disadvantage of high fidelity sound recordings. Alright, well what's an advantage first of all? Why would you want a hi-fi system? Well the answer is because the sound recording quality is much better. Right? If we have a very high fidelity sound recording, or a very high fidelity sound reproduction, then we're hearing the reproduced sound as an almost exact copy of the original sound, right? So it means that high fidelity sound recordings are more accurate a copy. But hang on, if we want nice, good, accurate sound recordings, then what could possibly be a disadvantage to having a high fidelity sound recording? Well, the answer here is, of course, to do with the amount of data it takes to store a high fidelity recording. If we digitize a high fidelity recording, then we're going to have a huge number of samples and a huge number of different values for each sample. This means that we have a lot of data, and that means that if we want to send it anywhere, or if we want to store it on a CD or a DVD, it's going to take up a lot of space as data. And so if we want to store anything else in that CD, we might not have enough room. Uh, so it is possible, even if we have a high fidelity recording, to compress it using particular uh, computer algorithms. And so that might look like a zip file 
or an MP3 recording. Both of these, though, will remove a small amount of the data in order to compress it better. So although it is possible to fit uh, a lot of, for example, MP3 files on a CD and only a small number of raw wave data, uh, the MP3 recordings won't be quite as high quality as the raw wave data. Question 5. Explain the relationship between sampling rate and fidelity. Can you figure this one out? It shouldn't be too hard. The fidelity of a recording is a measure of how many segments we split it into, or rather how closely it mimics the original sound, whereas the sampling rates are how, how often we split a recording per second. Can we see that there's going to be a relationship between the number of splits and the fidelity of the recording? Remember that if we want high fidelity, we need to mimic almost exactly the original sound. Right? But if we're only taking a couple of samples per second, we can't really do that. So if we want to make a high fidelity recording, we're going to need lots of samples. So when an analog waveform is digitized, it is divided. And uh, we, of course, have to take the amplitude of the wave and store that digitally as well. But if we take more samples, then we can have thinner chunks of digitized data. And that means that when we put them all together, it'll look very, very similar to the original waveform. Right? If we only take a few samples per second, then the waveform we end up with will be very, very chunky and very, very dissimilar to the original recording. So for this reason, if we have a higher sampling rate, we also have higher fidelity. So, uh, that's the end of the questions. We've talked a bit about the relationship between sampling and fidelity and exactly what those terms mean. We've also talked about how we can transfer an analog, uh, analog signal into a digital signal.